Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to week seven of Advocacy Days. Can you believe that we're already starting to wrap things up here for the session? Um, anyways, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Taylor Crisp. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, my visual description, I've got um, uh, my hair pulled back and my a blurred screen and I'm just kind of wearing a orange top with a gray sweater. Um, we are going to go over why so many people are in crisis today. We've got a bunch of an amazing speakers um, and folks um, from DDA with us. And um, here with me, I have my favorite co-host. Um, I'm going to have her introduce herself. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tanika. I come to you by way of DuPont, Washington. I am mom to a 10-year-old who's on the autism spectrum. Uh, that's how I am active in this community. And I'm so happy to join Taylor again today for Advocacy Days. I can't believe they're almost over, if you can believe that. Uh, for a visual description, I am an African-American woman. My hair is in a fro. I am wearing glasses. I have on some hoops and a cream top. It looks kind of white. And I have a blurred background, sort of. My hair is messing with the camera. So it's a little blurred, a little not blurred. Just kind of depends on when you catch me on screen. Um, thank you for joining us here today for Advocacy Days. Um, excited to talk about crisis, to hear from our panelists today. And if you could please um, introduce yourself in the chat. We're so happy you joined us. And at the bottom of the screen, we have a Q&A button. If you'd like to ask a question, please put that in there. And then we have the chat free open for everyone to have a discussion. So again, thank you for joining us today. And uh, so this morning, we're gonna kind of kick things off uh, with Kathy Murahashi, um, just kind of going over the topic to um, kind of transition us into today, so. Great. Oops. Good morning, everyone. So good to be here. And um, today's topic is why are so many people in crisis? You know, we hear this from across the state, that people that are going into crisis and terrible, terrible stories. Um, and so we have uh, people today that will be some panels, some people from DDA, um, some people that are working on different things, um, somebody from the DD Ombuds, and then some people that will be sharing their personal stories as well of being in crisis. So just some high level things about crisis, you know, some of the things that we know is that our systems are not designed to accommodate our folks' unique needs. Um, you know, things are meant for the everyday folks, um, but we know our folks have very unique needs. Um, whether it's physical needs or whether it's um, folks who have challenges expressing the, their needs and how they express their needs. Um, and on top of that, we know we don't have an adequate um, network of workers. You know, we need a much bigger workforce who is adequately, adequately trained and um, that can meet the needs. We just know that there's the capacity problem across the state is a problem. And, you know, not only do we need workers, but we need them to be appropriately trained and adequately experienced um, to, to work with our folks. You know, sometimes when we go to the doctor, you know, fo folks with disabilities go to the doctor, they don't know how to deal you know, they, they're not experienced with the particular disabilities or their particular needs. And it's across the spectrum, you know, both in the medical field and behavioral health, you know, whether it's therapists or direct support workers and educators, we know that we need to, them to be at appropriately trained, adequately experienced, and actually well paid so that to, to, that meets the needs of the individuals. 
So what do we need? Well, yeah, we need a lot of training and we need to be planning. We need to plan for crisis. You know, we need to, if we don't think about it and plan how we can best support people before they go into crisis, um, that's why we end up in crisis is because we haven't adequately planned. So we need to be planning. And with that, and there's a whole lot of more things and a whole lot of people that know a lot more about this than I do. Um, so I am, I think we will go on to our next panel. Do you want to enter? Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then the DDA panel. Um, they, does she want to start sharing? Introduce yourself and who's on the panel from DDA and share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being here. Um, am I sharing right now already? You are. Yes. Oh, good. I didn't even mean to hit this button. So I guess I did. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm just here to share this, to share my screen, but I'm Valerie Kinchy. I, uh, I'm the uh, waiver residential unit manager at DDA headquarters and the rest of the team that's with me here is, um, is going to do the presenting, but a uh, visual description, I'm a, a uh, white older woman with lots of gray hair, um, wearing glasses and a orange shirt. Um, so with that, I think the first person up, I believe, is Kim. Do you want to introduce yourself? Okay. And hopefully, I, did I unmute myself? Yep. <laughs> Start there. <laughs> and I believe, actually, I'm sharing right now, uh, I oh. think. It doesn't matter. One of us is, and I think it's okay. me. Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> My name is Kim Calkins, and I am the Children's Residential Out of Home Services Program Manager and uh, with DDA. Uh, visual description, I'm a white woman, uh, brown hair, long brown hair, glasses, blurred background, and I have a tendency to talk too fast. So I will try to endeavor to talk slower. Uh, it's okay if you don't catch something, just give a nudge or something and say, say that again. Uh, I'll work on it. And uh, do we want to go on to the next person? Do you want me to go ahead and do my part of the slides um, and then move on to the next one, Valerie? Um, why don't we go ahead and introduce everybody first? Okay, then on to the next person. I And who is that, Anne-Marie? I think it is. Can you okay. guys hear me and see me? All right, <laughs> my screens are kind of weird. So hello, I'm Anne-Marie DeGroote. I am the um, Enhanced Residential Service Program Manager for DDA. I am also a white woman out of the Olympia area. I have my fun earrings on that are flowers to give us a little bit of joy today and our dreary weather. So thanks guys for being here and listening to what we have to say. I think next is Deanna. Good morning, I'm Deanna Aldridge. I am the Stabilization and Specialized Services Unit Manager at DDA Headquarters. And uh, I am also a Caucasian woman. I have blondish brown hair. I am wearing glasses and a blue sweater with a blurred background. And Val, do we have anybody else from our team that we're introducing? I think that's everybody. Hi, um, good morning, everybody. This is Casey Smartjassi. Oh, thank you. Um, I am also, I think I'm gonna cover enhanced respite services uh, for folks today. Um, my name is, again, is Casey Smartjassi. I am the chief of the Office of Integrated Systems of Care at DDA. I use she, her pronouns. And the description of me, I am a middle-aged Caucasian woman with long brown hair. I am wearing round glasses today with a cream colored top. And I have a background of an office behind me. There's a screen and I think I can see some flowers of some kind in the background there too. So thank you for having us. Happy to be here today. And I think we have one more, I think we have a couple, I think that's it for presenters to introduce. Thank you. Go right ahead. All right. Okay. And then, so first up, I'm here to talk about enhanced at-home services. 
which is a residential service for youth and it's a service delivery. The staffing is based, I guess we have a very minimal time. So I, if you have additional questions, please pop them in the chat because the time that we have for this is really not the amount of time we'd want to talk about the entire program, but just super high level. It is a residential service for youth and it's available to them up until the age of 21. And the staffing is very individualized. It's based on the assessed need of the youth. The additional staff training is required for our staff and it's tailored to meet those individual needs of the youth being served. There's also increased consultation hours to teach and train our staff on individual service plans. So again, everything is very individualized to the youth, their needs and what they need and what their provider needs. Um, some potential additional trainings that we have that they're all required to take, all the staffing are required to take, which includes mental health basics for youth with IDD, youth informed trauma, youth focused trauma informed care, crisis prevention and intervention trainings, and specially designed trainings specific to a diagnosis, such as autism, FAS, FAD, any other diagnosis that might affect the delivery of the service. Youth are eligible when they're re-entering the community from an institutional setting. And the providers, if with our legislative funding that's been available, providers can add this service to their current contract. If you have a question, like I said, please feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, Okay, next I'm here to talk a little bit high level about what we call enhanced respite services. Go ahead and next screen, thank you. Um, enhanced respite services is um, a service that is provided in a staff residential home, similar to the ones that Kim described for enhanced out of home services. It's a different contract type that provides short term stabilization to youth uh, 30 day stay. Um, and it is the service design is focused on supporting um, skill development uh, related to habilitative goals. The service is provided in a community setting. These are licensed settings by the Department of Children, Youth and Families, and then DDA contracted to provide the service delivery. Uh, this provides recommendations. The, the um, service provider will uh, develop the habilitative goals that have been identified by the family, and then uh, the provider supports the skill development of the youth in achieving those goals, as well as providing some teaching and training to the parent on how to bring that skill building back into the home environment. Next slide, please. Children and youth are ages eight uh, to 18 and are coming from their family home. Uh, currently, we have five enhanced respite services beds in the Spokane area. Enhanced respite mm -hmm. services has been around for uh, 10 plus years. And over the years, we've had different various locations available. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, we lost all of our providers on the west side of the state. So we are actively, um, at this time, our team is um, really uh, putting attention and focus on rebuilding that provider capacity on the west side so that there will be more opportunities for families in the state um, to access the service closer to their home communities. Thank you. And again, just as Kim said, please put any questions you have in the chat. I'm happy to talk more about it. Hello, I'm Anne-Marie DeGroote again. I'm the Enhanced Residential Services Program Manager. And I am going to be talking to you about the complex need pilot program. The complex need pilot program will provide an enhanced daily rate to a participating supported living and group home, training home providers. Providers will develop a more robust staff train staff team and better to better serve clients complex support needs to remain successfully in their community of choice. Some of the things that um, this program will do is um, support providers to provide a behavioral analyst or a similar credential pro staff, have designated staff to work in the community on their managed care organizations and provide opportunities for their staff to become board certified or uh, board certified and dual diagnosis training. Next, 
In addition, direct care staff will receive additional person-centered training to better support the clients in the community. The program requires robust training, a robust training curriculum in addition to their current requirements. Additional training will include dual diagnosis, core competencies, trauma-informed practices, crisis prevention and intervention trainings, and an additional six hours of client-specific training. Complex needs program will um, support 30 clients from state or any hospital that um, in the state. Um, the priority population will be um, clients that are eligible for discharge or at risk of going to the hospital. Clients to be eligible, they will need to have two or more extensive behaviors indicated on the person-centered plan and also has a history of frequent use of emergency services. It is anticipated that all 30 clients will be served by no, the end of November this year. And again, if you guys have any additional questions, please put them in the chat. Or, or put them in the Q&A. The Q&A. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, okay, so and DDA has uh, crisis diversion services that I would like to share a little bit of with uh, with you all about. Um, we have two different models for this service. We have a bed based model, which is in a residential setting in the community, and the stabilization supports are provided um, to the individual while during their stay. We assist them with connecting with other resources and generally just to help them to stabilize so that they can um, return to where they were previously living or to transition successfully to the next setting. Mobile diversion services um, are le a little bit less intensive. It's not a 24 hour support, but it does come to the individual where they are. We bring the service to the person in their existing home. And that helps to keep them in place and preserve that arrangement. Um, services are delivered to evaluate the challenges and identify strategies for success, both for the individual and for their support system, their caregivers. Um, as I mentioned, we'll help to connect them to medical, mental health, and community resources if that's a need that they have. Um, the uh, diversion services also provide provide crisis prevention supports and training, again, to the primary caregivers in hopes of um, preventing a crisis from escalating to the point that someone would need an institutional setting or hospital. And um, they also provide individual support and reinforcement for skill building for the individual, again, to foster their success in their community. Priority population for diversion services are those that are at risk of a loss of employment, residence, and or provider. Um, people who are frequently using crisis services, 911, hospital emergency rooms, um, things of that sort. Um, individuals who have been recently hospitalized for non-medical reasons um, or who have been unable to discharge um, because of non-medical barriers, and those that are at risk of inpatient uh, treatment in a mental health or stabilization setting. And again, um, we welcome questions in the Q&A section. There are a few questions in there. Um, let's see. Um, and you may have answered this one. Are the five beds in Spokane located at Excelsior School? Oh, couldn't get myself off mute. This is Casey speaking. Um, no, it's not Excelsior. We have two providers in the Spokane area. One is called The Source and the other is Golden Youth Services that provide, that are contracted to provide the service in Spokane. Okay. And somebody was just confused. Is the program that Deanna was talking about the intensive habilitation service or is it a different service? No, the, the diversion services are uh, exclusively for adults age 18 and up. Um, yeah, intent, this is Casey speaking. Intensive habilitation services is another stabilization service model that DDA offers to youth uh, ages 8 to 18 or 8 to 21 if enrolled in school, actually. Um, and it is up to, unlike, like it's similar, um, 
uh, service delivery wise to enhanced respite services, but it's up to 90 days instead of 30 days. Also focuses on the um, skill building uh, towards habilitative goals. And we have two providers currently. We're actually really excited. We got legislative funding last session to expand the intensive habilitation services program. We have one state operated provider located in Lakewood, Washington um, that operates, you know, has three, uh, can serve three people at a time. We just as of December have a brand new first ever contracted intensive habilitation services provider in the Spokane area um, who's also working up to operating three beds. They just opened their doors in December. That's uh, the provider's name is Visions for a New Beginning. And then we have funding to develop a, a second contracted bed and are uh, working to do so hopefully somewhere up on the west side, north Seattle, north area area so that we can target all parts of the state to have a provider available um, closer to people's communities where they'd like to receive the service. Great. The other question in the box is um, mobile crisis diversion, who provides this service? So that is through a contracted DDA provider. Currently, the service is only available in Region 3. It was a, started as a pilot program and the legislature allocated funding for us to expand that. So we are actively working with um, regions one and two, the east side and then uh, north uh, King County northward to develop mobile models for those communities as well. The provider that is currently contact contracted in region three is Hope Human Services and they offer mobile services in and around Pierce County, Thurston, um, Kitsap, and then down in the Vancouver, Cowlitz, and I believe possibly out towards Skamania as well. Great. Um, Michelle, you may need to make some clarifying this, but um, how would you describe the training your staff must complete or minimum level of higher ed completed in order to provide the level of support for people with this need? Um, Michelle, which which program are you talking about for that? I heard a mention of the staff that will be doing the intervention or um, providing support for individuals with this behavior. And I'm just curious, is this just, do you hire within DSHS? Is it your own staff member, like with BCBA uh, criteria or... Is it, is it more? I'm just curious where you find the staff to provide this service and support. And Michelle, this is Casey. Uh, which program are you specifically interested in hearing about? Adults or kids or both? I'm sorry, how about adults? <laughs> okay. All right, I will take that one. This is Anne Marie. Um, I believe this is in reference to the complex needs pilot program. Um, we have the additional requirements as a part of that program to enhance the training of the staff. Um, staffing is found within the program. Um, sometimes they have a vacancy and so their staff um, can uh, work with an additional client or they are hired specifically to work with the client. Um, the idea is Whoever is hired, whether it's in the program, somebody that works with that provider already, or somebody that is hired in, um, to work with the client, is trained. And there's that additional training is to make them more um, feel like they have better tools and more success with a client if they have more education, more understanding, more I like to say tools in their toolbox. Not you, you need more than just the hammer and the, the screwdriver and the pliers. So we want to give them a robust um, set of skills from um, very specific training. So if a client has a very specific need, we want to ensure that those staff working with that client ha ha understands, knows, and has a very clear plan on how to deal with that very specific need. So it is putting a the idea of education 
and around any stuff that is in that program working with that client. Thanks, Henry. I appreciate the answer. If I could dive just a little deeper, and if you don't have the answer, that's totally cool. I'm just driving. I'm driving this <laughs> to get to an answer. It's the quality of training. Um, this is behavior specialist type level. So I'm really curious how deep that training goes um, to prepare these these providers, what they're about to get into. So uh, is the training within DSHS? Is it outside DSHS? Like, yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Can I, do you mind if I take that one in, Marie? Go ahead. So I, so the vision for the pilot is that we kind of come at this from a couple of different directions. We have, um, you know, formalized classroom training that we require them to take. Some of that is provided through um, uh, National Association of, of Dual Diagnoses, um, which is an organization that focuses on um, people that have um, um, IDD and mental health issues. Um, and we also have, um, we have some from other, you know, nationally recognized organizations that provide that training. Some of it, we do have a few that I believe that are provided by DDA. Um, but then the other direction we come from, that's the reason we have the BCBA in there. So, uh, they're not only responsible for writing the plans for the client, but they're also in there doing on the job training, spot check kind of things with staff, making sure that they're catching the, the staff in the moment when they see um, how a client is reacting to something and and see and help the, the staff to uh, hone their skills specific to that individual as opposed to, um, you know, the kind of stuff you learn sitting in a classroom hopefully is going to help build that foundation, but then the, the BCBA or similar position will kind of help hone in those skills in terms of like an on the job kind of uh, training. So that's kind of the vision with the pilot and kind of similar to some of the other programs as well. Great. Thank you, Valerie. Thanks, Anne-Marie, for the clarifying answer. Thanks. Um, somebody has asked how long the pilot has been going. It started um, July 1st of 2023. So just a few months, about six months. And do you know how what the, the scope, the length of it, or is this, since it's a pilot, how long it's is a, it supposed to go for? It's a pilot. So it's for the biennium. So June 30th, 2025. Thank you. However, this, the the um, the funding is going to continue for um, clients who continue to um, demonstrate that need, individuals who demonstrate that need. So for those that have it, it won't go away. Right. But they may just not. Uh, at, yeah. It won't be adding money. To, right. Yeah. That's great. And yeah. hopefully, they'll it'll be considered successful, and they will ref add, add additional funding. Right. <laughs> I hope so. That's what we're counting on. That's great. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, checking to see, so I know some of our speakers came in under Dean Driscoll's name. And so I can't tell if our next speaker is here yet or not, but you may be there under Bean. Is uh, Katrina Davis there. Is she here? Yes. Hi. <laughs> um, does it say okay, bean? the other bean. <laughs> um, hi, folks. Um, is, do you want me to talk now? Yes. And did you bring other people with you? Are, are your other colleagues coming yes. with you today? Or? Um, okay. No, we, we huddled this morning to go over the notes. Um, Honestly, they can't pull away from the patient population. Um, okay. It's two psych psychiatrists and a case manager who's my colleague, and we're just, um, they can't pull away, even for 10 minutes. And I apologize, everyone, but we did huddle. No worries. And so I'll be <laughs> representing that. <clears throat> and I, I don't think my camera works. I'm going to try to turn it on. Yeah, it doesn't work. So um, it, it, what happens if I turn on my camera, I get terrible bandwidth. So um, I'll, do you want me to start now, Cassie, and I'll introduce myself? Yes. Thank you for being here, Katrina. Okay. You, you bet. You bet. So hi, everybody. I'm Katrina Davis, and um, I am a, a Caucasian middle-aged woman with very big hair this morning, so it's good that you don't see me because <laughs> she 
it's, I've, I've had a head cold for weeks and I just I'm not thriving these days, but I am, I was so happy that, um, that Kathy and others asked that we from Seattle children's, um, just provide some information about the population we're seeing. So, um, I'm a family advocate case manager at the emergency department at Seattle Children's Hospital. <clears throat> I worked at the Autism Center for years as a family advocate and moved over to our emergency department just given the high acuity and just the cycling uh, crisis we're seeing. And, and a lot of the same families just going in and out of crisis. Very traumatizing crisis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm going to reflect some of the comments that my colleagues shared with me. And um, and it, please interrupt me if um, if there's something, because I can't see y'all, and, and if there's something, Kathy or somebody, I need to clarify, just interrupt me because I can't see you. Okay. All right. Thanks. So <clears throat> thank you. Um, I'm also the proud parent of a 24-year-old autistic young man who um, experiences um, significant challenging behaviors as a manifestation of his disability. He is um, more on the profound um, he's profoundly autistic. Uh, I know that's a word that's controversial, but I'll just say that he's got very high needs, intellectual impairment, um, can experience um, some challenging behaviors that are, can, can be quite health harming and pretty intense for the family and for him. Um, he is also an amazing young man who is the light, the light of our life. Um, did you say something, Kathy? Nope. Okay. Go right ahead. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so the population I serve at the um, emergency department, we will, I, I will define them as, these are profoundly autistic folks who have intellectual impairment. They are DDA enrolled or eligible, very high needs, you know, the line of sight care, high adaptive needs, support for almost all activities of daily living. And the majority, pretty much 100% experience significant challenging behaviors. As a manifestation of their disability, I, I know we say behavior is communication, but this is a population that even though um, they might be limited verbal, lacking receptive or expressive communication, but even if we can find ways to help them communicate, it might reduce the behaviors, but it doesn't extinguish them because it's a manifestation of the disability. And this is something that's just part of their disability. Um, and so it's not, it doesn't just go away. And it's, it's, it's just like we might have, you know, high adaptive needs. We, you know, these are folks that have high behavior acuity. So, um, the, I just want to say that this is hard to talk about because I'm, I'm, I'm going to use simple, clear language, but it can feel uncomfortable. And I, I'm, I'm not going to say I apologize. I just want to say that up front, that we're talking about things like head banging, in gouging, eye poking. We've had patients in the last year who have lost sight because of eye poking. This is um, not willful, intentional self-harm. This is really intense uh, reactions or just something. It's hard to figure out why this is happening sometimes. See, there's very intense behaviors and unsafe bolting into traffic or bodies of water. This is, the, this is what I'm talking about. And this is the difficult truth and the difficult reality many people in our, in our, and their families are in our state are experiencing. We call these folks difficult to discharge. And I cannot blame parents for not picking up their child when their child meets discharge criteria. Our criteria for discharge is very different. Um, you know, if, if they meet baseline and they're not, um, and harm for 24 hours, we send them home. We have to. The emergency department is for medical concerns and mental health concerns, but it's not a holding tank. And, I, and we lack these intermediate care facilities for this population. You guys, they don't get to go to Fairfax. They don't get to go to Navos. <laughs> um, they, they, they re, that, this population is rejected at those places because their needs outmatch the, um, the care and the therapy provided at these places. So we often hear, we can't meet this child's needs, um, our, our model of care, their, their needs exceed our model of care. So parents are saying, I, this, my child's needs exceed what I can do safely in the family home. So they don't pick them up. And guess what? And I don't blame them. I was in that boat. My son went through this in his teen years. I was scared to take him home. There's two of us, barely. <laughs> and, um, and, and his sister who was young. And so I just, there's a lot of burden placed on families right now. And, that, and it's unfair to the kid to be stuck in a hospital, which, by the way, is a very restrictive environment. If they're blowing out and having a real tough time, they have, you know, we have to strap because there's no, they can't run around the emergency department. It's not an inpatient facility. Um, and sometimes sedative medications are used. This is not fair to the person experiencing that challenging behavior. Our PBMU, which is the inpatient unit for mental um, health 
and behavioral concerns and, and you know, really the high needs and they require um, inpatient care. The beds, we can't, they're full constantly. We expanded the program to include an intensive biobehavior program for this population. The beds are always full. Most of the time, it's, they meet criteria for that program, so there's no space. Um, so why is this happening? And Kathy, what, how much time do I have? I want to make sure I end on time. What, uh, you have, you have a few more minutes. minutes, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'm going to step it up here. So why, why is this DDA enrolled population going into crisis in the first place? Kathy touched on that. Um, you know, things like the home and community-based services, caregivers, respite, specialized habilitation, these services exist, and so does applied behavior analysis, which is commonly prescribed for this population. Speech and OT exists, and we have special education services. But all these services, yes, they exist, but for this population, um, we often hear this person's need exceed our model of care, and they are denied. Or there are no caregivers, there are no providers with the skill, expertise, and comfort level with this population, and nor are they mandated. And they might, let's say ABA, yes, that's a therapy that's, if, if it's prescribed, you get it. But guess what, or it's, you should get it. But what happens, there's, there's very few ABA providers in our state that serve this population. Everywhere the parent looks for services, there are closed doors or barriers. Of course, they go into crisis. Yes, the services exist, but they can't access them. And by the way, we, we put a lot of pressure on parents, sending them on goose chases. Because what I often hear, and it breaks my heart, is, well, parents just haven't looked hard enough to find these services. And I think DDA is probably nodding their head. These services exist, but this is a tough population to serve. I'm in meetings with DDA and Medicaid case managers and school staff and WISE wraparound programs, and everybody's kind of playing, pointing at each other like, don't you do that? And so it turns into this pretty painful game of hot potato. And nobody's to blame. It's the services. We lack the services this population needs. So it's, it's we, we joke with my colleagues, it's sort of a vicarious trauma. You're hearing these terrible stories all day, and you can't help. You can't help what you, you can't provide what that family and that individual needs because it doesn't exist for them in the intensity it does. And by the way, we, we, you know, when all else fails and the parent says, I can't do this anymore, when we're talking out-of-home services, these same closed doors are met because this is a population that requires sometimes an inpatient level of care. DDA residential services can't always offer that. They don't offer that. So the, the child ends up leaving our state. This is an out-of-state placement, which is traumatizing for everyone to take this kid away from family, school, home, community, all they know. Um, so we put a lot of pressure on DDA, and, and sometimes it's just something they just don't offer. We, we, we're sending kids out of state, um, paid for by Medicaid, the school, or the school, or if the parent can provide it, which is, or pay for it, it's very rare that they can. Um, so I think I'm, I'm just going to, I think I'll wrap it up there that we, we just need, we need to start creating the services designed for this population, not trying to square peg round hole them into services that exist. One, they're not available to them. And two, um, sometimes that's not enough. It's just not enough. They need different types of support, positive behavior supports, things that don't exist that are paid for in our state. They need an intermediate care facility to go to that's safe, community-based, but it, it's not a hospital. They need the, they, so they don't have to leave the state or they don't have to be over-medicated at home isolated with overwhelmed, outmatched parents. Um, so this, I, my heart bleeds for this population because I see it every day, and I, I wish sometimes our decision makers and elected officials could see what the, the families and this individual experiences. I've used the word unethical. We have to create new services designed specifically for this population, and when we do, please talk to the parents. <laughs> they are the ones um, living it. They know their child best, and this is a population who often can't advocate they advocate every day for their own needs, just by the way they live their life, but they can't go talk to elected officials. They can't be here today. My son would not understand this at all. He's lovely, but he couldn't, he couldn't testify on behalf of his needs, so we have to turn to the parents a little bit more, too. Thank you for DDA for starting that family advisory committee, which I think you're going to get some great feedback from them. All right, I'm going to, I haven't checked the chat for any questions. Kathy, is there anything else um, you oh, I should address? I just or, okay. super appreciate um all the work you do and um, for being really real about the what you see and experience. Um, I don't see any questions, so I'm we're going to um, skip. No, I hope this is OK. I'm going to let the family mentors go next because they need to leave. Is that all right with you, Noah? 
Um, so I'm going to let them go and then um, next, and then we'll have Noah. So Kelly, thank you. And yeah, Diane absolutely. and Tammy, I think. Um, I actually, I'm sorry, Noah, that we had to bump you. We actually have um, an 11, 11 o'clock uh, DDA meeting. Um, and actually, I wanted to introduce myself, Kelly Church. I'm the Family Mentor Project Coordinator. Um, I've got a little bit of a cold today, I think, like the rest of us do on this call. Um, my visual description is I'm a older white woman with long, straight red hair. Sometimes it's curly. Um, I'm wearing glasses and um, my background is my home office with my fireplace and probably going to turn that on pretty soon. It's a little cold. Um, I wanted to let everyone know there's four mentors statewide. Diane Larson is our assistant project coordinator and we have Tammy McGrath here as well. And then we have Roz Bethman. Um, and I'm just going to go into exactly what the Family Mentor Project is. Uh, we started back in 2011. The project was actually funded for two years in a Senate bill. And that Senate bill happened to be the closure of what used to be our fifth residential habilitation center, which was Francis Haddon Morgan Center in Bremerton. So we had approximately about um, close to 80 individuals that had to leave Francis Haddon Morgan Center uh, when the legislators decided that they were going to close Francis Haddon Morgan Center. So the Family Mentor Project was named as a pilot project just for two years. And honestly, for two years, um, it took over a year. It took about 14 months, I believe, for the Developmental Disabilities Council and the ARC of Washington State to actually find a family mentor, um, which would be one FTE full-time employee to be a family mentor. Uh, so the funding wasn't actually utilized for the first year, as you always hear with developmental disabilities when a pilot project um, kicks off, it takes a long time to get things started. So once a family mentor was found, which was Rosemary Kruger, Rosemary started working in all four of the other residential habilitation centers, which is Yakima Valley School, Lakeland in Spokane, um, Furcrest, which is in Shoreline, and Rainier out in Buckley, helping families move. Um, and really what that entailed was listening to family stories, meeting families statewide. So you can imagine Washington State is pretty big. We had one family mentor in 2011 to 2012 working statewide in their car meeting families where they were. We Back then we weren't doing a lot of Zooms. We weren't doing a lot of visual. It was getting in your car and getting out there. Uh, so Rosemary actually ended up getting funded annually past 2013. She hired another part-time mentor. Fast forward to 2016. I'm going to throw out an acronym. It's called PASSR, P-A-S-R-R, Pre-Admission Screening and Resident Review. What PASSR is, is skilled nursing facility clients that are living in skilled nursing facilities, and these are developmental disabilities administration clients and home and community service clients statewide. We get to go in with PASSAR assessors. It's basically a PASSAR case resource manager. We ended up, Family Mentor Project, ended up being in this PASSAR lawsuit that was delivered in 2016. So in 2017, Rosemary Kruger decided to retire. So I came in exactly um, seven years ago. Um, February 16th, I've been here coordinating since then and built this wonderful team. One of the things about the mentors listening to Katrina, I actually had to hold back tears because that's my son's story. For two years, we lived in the inpatient psychiatric unit at Children's Hospital. Jordan is going to be 26 in two months. 
and he moved out of our family home at 12 years old. I had a new baby that I wasn't raising. We all have those same crisis stories, and that's why we're family mentors. The family mentors also have the background of working just with organizations like the Ark of Snohomish County. Each one of us worked as parent coalitions. We all worked and did a lot of the beautiful work um, that the families have done. We've done a lot of advocacy and we've learned a lot. So um, that is one thing that we can lend to our families is we've been in the trenches. We've been in crisis and each one, each one of the mentors, our kids, our adult children have such different levels of needs. You would think that our kids could all live together. You would think they all have different needs. And so listening to Katrina, that is the reality of what families are facing. And, you know, I'll, I'll quote Roz Bethman when we were meeting with DDA not too long ago is that Yes, these families have their their loved ones may potentially have a roof over their head in a skilled nursing facility or a residential habilitation center. They may or may not want their loved one to be there. They're also, a lot of the families that we work with are nowhere close to their loved ones. Nowhere close to their loved ones. They can be on the opposite sides of the state. So the four of us mentors, um, and this is exactly what we're funded to do. And it does break our heart. Um, Diane Larson and I get a lot of phone calls and really um, follow through with those families because they are needing family mentor services. And we're really honored to work with the population that we work with. And we do understand that this is a very highly unmet need. I'm gonna have Diane in the chat drop in the Family Mentor Project website it's a beautiful resource. Uh, there's videos on there that show people after 60 or 70 years having to leave the residential habilitation centers. So we work with a very diverse population, whether it's younger individuals or like I just talked about people having to leave. Um, it's really a personalized service. We are the first ones to say we will come to you. So statewide, um, we're very blessed to have the funding, the four of us, to meet families where they're at. We listen to family stories. We strategize with families. We help them with the transition. We'll take them out on supported living tours and adult family home tours. We are there the whole entire time for the families and the clients. We also do follow up with these families after, and that's something that we're seeing and we're really proud of Developmental Disabilities Administration. There is a lot of quality assurance that's going on with the new transitional services that are kicked off and we can see things expanding. And so, um, I, you know, Diane, would you like to say anything else? Did I miss any high points since we have our 11 o'clock meeting after this, all of us? You did great. You did great. Please go visit our website. There's a lot of great information out there. Okay. Did we have any questions in the chat at all, Kathy? I don't see any at this moment. Okay. Does anybody else have questions? Thank you so much for being here. You know, this is one of those pieces that helps, you know, the people who have been in crisis and it's like helping them to move to a place of less crisis. So we appreciate um, the work that you do and for being here today. So, and we'll let you get to your other meeting. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Noah, do you want to? Hop in. We have Noah Seidel from the Developmental Disabilities Ombuds, who's going to share about some of the things that he's been working around on around crisis. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. I have a little PowerPoint. Hey everyone, my name is Noah Seidel, and I use he, him pronouns, and a visual description is I am white with black glasses, black hair, wearing a purple shirt, and then I have like a Didi Ombuds background. 
It's white on one side, green on the other side, and it says DD Ombuds right behind me. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the DD Ombuds and what we are doing around crisis. And I have some subtitles on the bottom of my screen um, that you can also read. Um, so our office was created after a person with a developmental disability was being abused by her state provided caregiver and I'm going to be talking about some rough issues just a heads up like all the folks who've been talking today. Um, but after this person was um, being abused by her care provider, um, their legislators brought together advocates and DDA and they passed what we call Laura's Law. And it created two things. It created the Office of Developmental Disability Ombuds and Enhanced Case Managers at DDA. And then the Enhanced Case Managers have a, a smaller caseload and they visit their um, clients more often. Our office, we have a DD Ombuds in each region. Um, and then we have our state DD Ombuds, Betty Sweeterman, and then a self-advocacy educator, Tim McHugh. And just, just to notice that I'll be talking about some rough issues. So if you need to take a break, feel free. Um, and then I have some phone numbers and a chat hotline folks can talk to if they need to afterwards. Um, so we started really looking at crisis in 2018, right after our office was created. We put out our first report we called Diverting Crisis. And in that report, we found a few glaring issues. Um, individuals are living in undesired or inappropriate housing. Individuals are unable to access crisis support services when they're in crisis. Individuals have to move far away from their families, communities, and jobs in order to receive services. Um, and then service providers do not accommodate for changing needs for individuals they serve. And also when somebody's needs change or their provider's needs change, if they have like a family provider who is getting older um, to get the services that they need. So that led us to finding out that people are stuck in hospitals. Um, so that led us to our second report, which was a stuck in hospital report. Um, and we saw that individuals were being dropped off at hospitals. Sometimes they were going there, um, their service provider, residential provider were taking them because they couldn't provide them um, healthy and safe services. Um, some people went to a hospital with a medical condition, um, but then after they recovered, um, their needs might have changed or their provider determined that they can no longer take them back to their home. Um, so they're ready for discharge, but then they stayed there. Um, we also had family members who called us um, and told us that, you know, they're trying their best, but they don't think they can keep them or their family or the person safe. So they had to take them um, to the hospital. Um, we've also had people who their family member has passed away and they don't have an, another service provider. So they end up being in the hospital or we had a case where a person their mother had surgery and while their mother was recovering, they also had to stay at the hospital because they couldn't find a provider. Um, or folks who were removed from their home because of adult protective services and finding abuse and neglect. Um, so since 2018, you know, this number is kind of an estimate, but we work with over seven, 70 people, both adults and children who are stuck at hospitals. Um, but we don't have the complete data. Um, there was a bill that was passed, House Bill 1394, um, but that has DDA requiring collecting some data around people who are stuck in the hospital. Um, but it's a narrow picture. It's only coming from certain service settings, but not everybody stuck in the hospital. And then we've also heard from the hospital association that they don't have the complete data um, and all the information. So this is just kind of one sample in time from a couple of years ago. Um, just to kind of show the picture. Um, this is from a few different counties, so like Whatcom County had two people with developmental disabilities in the hospital. Um, the longest person that was there was for 119 days. Um, for Spokane, at that time there was eight people in the hospital, one for 11 months, one for nine months, one for five months, two for four months, and three for a month or less. So you know, that's staying there for a good amount of time. 
um, there was a person, there was in the Seattle area, just not whole King County, but just Seattle, we had eight people um, in the hospital at that time. And three people were there for more than a year. So I work with people who had to unfortunately celebrate a birthday while being stuck in the hospital waiting for a placement. Um, and then in Skagit County, there were two people at this time, one person for more than 100 days and one for more than 50 days. So this was just a, a moment in time. This was from 2019, but I just want to give a sample of what it might look like at, at a moment in time. And, you know, these numbers are constantly changing, um, but just kind of a picture. Um, so after we started looking at stuck in hospitals, we started really wanting to focus on children. And, you know, Katrina talked about some of these issues that I'll also cover, but, um, you know, out of out of home placement, but then out of state placement, you know, we don't want to see youth mm -hmm. with developmental disabilities getting sent out of state. Um, so in the problem, um, DDA does not share the data on age, ages of youth stuck in hospitals youth who cannot access at home services are getting stuck in hospitals youth cannot find services in washington are being sent out of state um, so we have a waiver in washington called the sibs waiver and this is the children intensive behavioral support um, so this is for children who are deemed that they might get placed out of home um, but we heard from families and youth who are on this waiver and um, so here are just some of the issues we heard. Um, case managers were unable to help families successfully navigate bureaucracy, which means those case managers didn't know all the services available and they were having trouble navigating the services. Um, wait lists for services, so like Katrina talked about, caregiver providers were totally booked. Um, many said you had to wait something like a couple years. Um, family members say they cannot stay up 24 hours, so family members you know, they in our state are the burden uh, providing these services and have need extra supports that they couldn't find from uh, other providers. And then family member burnout, um, responsible for organizing medical appointments, multiple caregiver schedules, training the caregivers, medically um, caretaking, following through on behavioral plans. Just we put a lot of emphasis on uh, the families um, that to do a lot. Um, and not provide them support. Um, so we heard from families and some things that, you know, they told us is um, out of home services ended um, and then they couldn't find a new provider quickly. So the person had to go to the hospital. Inadequate services to keep safe, youth safe at home, affordable housing, like we always talk about, housing not being accessible, medical knowledge. Um, and then, you know, we're sending youth out of state. Um, Families say that without enough services in Washington, youth are being funneled to expensive out-of-state placement. Number of youth sent out-of-state placements has increased quickly. Family members and advocate question conditions of out-of-state placements that can meet youth. You know, we can visit people in our state in support of living, in out-of-home services, but we can't, you know, the DD Ombuds can't fly to Arizona to go visit somebody. Um, so there's less eyes on the youth. Um, when youth are ready to come home, family members have a hard time making sure that their services can get up safely um, in Washington. Um, so the individual problem in advocacy, the systemic issues, but you know, we're hitting a brick wall sometimes on both ways. Um, so I just want to end with talking about what the DD Ombuds can do. Um, so we attend meetings. So there's someone that's separate from the service system helping advocate. Uh, we have access authority so we can talk to DDA staff, we can do records requests, we can visit people. Um, we can help explain the system to people. We're in tons of meetings, so um, we hear things a lot. We can help put pressure um, to find solutions so the families are not the only people doing it or the individuals with developmental disabilities. Sometimes we know the magic words. Um, it's asking for the right services at the right time. Um, sometimes it's have you sent out my referral packet. Um, can you put me on this waiver, you know, making sure the right questions are asking. Um, some big picture knowledge. So looking at the systemic and the individual advocacy, um, really seeing what's going on. Um, and then follow up. We can, like the family mentors, we can visit and help um, to make sure that transitions are smooth. Um, so that 
is just what I wanted to talk about, uh, kind of what the DD Ombuds are doing on this issue, and you know, we're constantly working on these issues. Thank you so much, Noah. That was really good information. Are there any other questions from folks? I didn't see any in the Q&A. There is a lot of discussion in the chat and um, lots of, uh, and there's a couple of links uh, Ramona provided on uh, the issue, on an issue paper. And uh, so there's a couple of links in there if you guys wanna check it out in the chat, some deep conversation. So, yeah. Looks like really good tools for people to use. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, I have, we have a couple of people that are going to share their stories and I'm going to check in is Robin Tatsuda here. There you are. So Robin shared some stories about some of the things they're experiencing at the arc of King County with some residents and I'm have her share these stories. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. So I shared this story at the King County Legislative Forum for Developmental Disabilities back in January, um, December. Um, but then at the end, I updated a little bit because one person is still experiencing stuff. So some of you may have heard this before. So I'm just going to read it. I hope you don't mind. I'm Robin Tatsuda, Executive Director at the Arc of King County. I live in the 36th Legislative District, and our agency serves individuals and families across all districts in King County and beyond. As a King County provider agency, we help individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, also known as IDD, of all ages and their families navigate the various disability resources and systems, including mental health and behavioral health care. We've recognized a huge gap at the intersection of IDD and mental health for many years, which only got worse during and after COVID. Many youth and adults with IDD tell us they cannot locate a mental health provider who understands the combination of IDD and mental health care. Because of this, people with IDD cannot find providers at a stage of preventative care. We are seeing more and more individuals going into crisis and their caregivers turning to 911, emergency departments, and other crisis services. However, most of these crisis services do not understand the intersection of IDD and mental health. For example, one mom we support told us that after spending hours in an emergency department with her autistic son, due to his escalated agitation and unsafe behaviors, she was told it is normal for autistic people to hear voices and there was nothing that could be done. The family was sent home without any support. I'd like to make sure we're all clear that it is not normal for autistic people to hear voices. So in case you weren't sure. We also at the Arc of King County provide supported living services to adults with IDD in the community who no longer live with their family. We're seeing more and more program participants experience increased mental, mental health challenges since the start of the pandemic with very little resources for support. As a supported living provider, we are not experts in mental or behavioral health, but we are challenged to deliver appropriate services to people with co-occurring IDD and mental health needs without the expertise. Sadly, in the last 10 months, two of our supported living participants ended up in the hospital because of mental health crisis. One individual, I'll call him John, was using antipsychotic medication and had been stable for over a decade. For unclear reasons, the doctor prescribing his medicine decided to slowly take him off his medication. With the decrease in his medication, John started to become more and more escalated, demonstrating behaviors we'd never seen before, including heightened anxiety, violence toward his roommates and staff, and running away from his home. We were not given any direction on what to watch out for with the changes in his medication or what to do if we identified negative results. Instead, as John escalated, we were forced to turn to the mental health crisis lines who directed us to use a mental health urgent care clinic in Snohomish County. The clinic is only open Monday through Friday business hours, and we were in crisis on a Friday night. 
Eventually, John ended up in a hospital emergency department where they admitted him for about two weeks. The hospital restarted his original antipsychotic medication and John stabilized and returned home. After his discharge, even still, we continue to struggle to ensure he has an appropriate doctor prescribing and monitoring his medication. Meanwhile, another program participant, I'll call her Sarah, was hospitalized for five months after several months of mental health deterioration and inadequate professional support. We assisted Sarah to seek mental health services and even brought her to the emergency department to get psychiatric help. However, she was turned away until she reached crisis levels. Sadly, because Sarah did not get the mental health support she needed soon enough, she went into a catatonic state for months while in the hospital's psychiatric intensive care unit. She was able to return home in November, but upon her return, she did not get any mental health support that she needed, and ultimately she ended up back in the hospital in January. She just got discharged from the hospital last week because the hospital claimed that she was stable, even though we, the ARC, and everyone at DDA advocated fiercely that that was not in her best interest. So she returned home last week, and we're very nervous that she will end up back in the emergency department any day. Before Sarah's psychiatric crisis, she was very independent with most of her daily activities, but now she needs help with almost everything, including her personal care, medication management, memory, decision making, etc. This crisis caused a dramatic change to her overall well being and continues to challenge us to ensure we can safely support her. Due to the lack of trained mental health professionals and no advanced training available to us as supported living providers, both individuals ended up in severe crisis. John and Sarah continue to struggle daily with long-term effects related to these crises. And these are just two examples of how our community is impacted by the lack of behavioral health workforce that's responsive to our needs. Thanks. Thanks for sharing those really difficult stories, Robin. Um, is Carol here? Carol Albreed? Yes, I'm here. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. Carol's going to share her story as well, her personal story. Uh, good morning, everyone. I was asked to speak on this topic because of my family's recent experience navigating the medical and mental health systems on behalf of our son, who's 29 and has ASD. While our son has always had high support needs, including behavioral, he was also friendly and social and had so many interests and activities that we had a really hard time keeping up with him. A few years ago, we noticed that he was regressing in all areas and withdrawing socially. His anxiety spiked, resulting in frequent meltdowns. When we reported these concerns to his site provider, they said that regression is common in adults with autism and adjusted his meds. With no other suggestions offered, we created our own plan. We increased his supports, including returning to speech and occupational therapy and working closely with a behavior therapist. Still, he continued to decline. He withdrew to his bedroom and retired from all of his activities with the exception of a daily trip to the park to swing, a lifelong passion, but sometimes when he was there, he would just bend over um, in the swing or hold his head and not swing. He was so uncomfortable and miserable. He became urinary incontinent and greatly limited food and liquid intake while refusing his meds, a recipe for disaster. He started pacing at night, sometimes for several hours. It was like he was in a trance and would go into a rage if we tried to redirect him. Over time, he became increasingly physically violent, injuring his dad and I and engaging in serious property damage. We turned to his primary care physician to address his poor appetite and urinary incontinence, and we were told that these symptoms were part of his autism and willful behavior. The doctor did do a urinalysis, and when it came back clear, he told us to see his psych providers for any further care related to these issues. 
we have since learned the term that describes when a provider attributes symptoms to a person's disability. It is called diagnostic overshadowing. We continued to report new and intensifying symptoms to his providers. His weight dropped dramatically. He was 130 pounds on a six foot frame. He alternated between urinary incontinence and urinary retention, and he was often dehydrated. He began holding his body in odd poses for extended periods of time, and he said that food was poison. At one appointment with a psych provider, we were told, you know, like we've said, it's just really hard to tease out what is autism and what is something else. That provider then referred us to his primary care physician to rule out anything physical, which of course we had already done. Enter the medical hot potato, which is a term that describes providers who, instead of taking ownership of a patient's care, pass the patient on to another provider. Providers grew visibly frustrated with us as we continued to press them for help and desperate e-care messages frequently went unanswered. We asked multiple times if and when we should take him to a hospital for medical intervention. And finally, very late in this process, we were advised to call 911 during a meltdown to have him transported to the nearest hospital. A turning point finally came when we reported that it seemed like he was literally stuck at times. Apparently, this was a trigger word or symptom that prompted the provider to refer us to another provider in their practice. He met with us virtually with a social worker present to inform us that he suspected our son had autistic catatonia, a devastating and life-threatening condition. This was at least almost a year and a half after we first reported these distressing changes to our son's baseline. Unfortunately, early diagnosis and treatment of autistic catatonia is critical for best patient outcomes. There isn't time today to share details about the barriers we face to get an official diagnosis and treatment, which were nearly insurmountable, or what finally landed our son in the hospital for one of the unfortunate extended stays. There is so much more to our son's story. We want to be clear that it isn't our intention to bash providers. We know that providers are stretched thin and they don't know what they don't know. We have learned from out-of-state providers and other families that the West Coast is way behind in understanding autistic catatonia and other psychological disorders in people with IDD and autism. It is our hope that this gap is narrowing due to the intense focus on the rise of individuals in crises and that fewer people will suffer the way our son has. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> we appreciate you sharing that difficult story. Um, are there any questions for anybody that have come up? Okay, I have one more video story to share with you. Yeah. And, oh, did I miss something? Okay, just making sure. Like Sean has his hand up there. Okay, go ahead. This is Sean. I just wanted to say before you play Corinna's video, Kathy, mm -hmm. you're about to see my friend Corinna Ball that due to a couple safety issues in her previous environment, had to get assistance in moving very fast and needed help from Krista Milhoffer from People First and several others to upgrade her waiver services to the core waiver so she can get 24 hour supports. So Corinna will be talking about her experiences. I will add Corinna had a big circle of friends to help her. Please remember not everyone have that much support. Well, I don't know that much. Oh, that's pretty bad in mind when you watch that video. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Oops. Here we go. My name is Karina Phil. I live in Shoreline, Washington, and my legislative district is the 32nd Legislative District. Mm -hmm. 
the process was actually pretty quick. Um, it had to be because I had to be out within a month of where I was living. Um, so I um, really had no care providers. So it was really between Krista and Tony um, from DDA and Scott Lyven. Good. Um, and I'm really not seen anything move so quickly before. Um, and my case manager, they all kind of did it together. Um, and um, I was kind of in crisis at that time. I just requested that I um, make a change because I needed to be, um, I needed to move to a different living situation. So I requested to be put on a different waiver. Usually it takes like three to four months to get the process approved. And it, it took, my, my case was actually um, pushed through pretty quickly um, due to um, my situation. I had some help getting it pushed through because I was in crisis and I was, um, rescued from the emergency room and some other said um some other stuff was going on. Um I think just if people knew that the core waiver was even an option. I mean, a lot of people don't even know it's an option. Um that they can they can even ask for it. I think communication, um, more communication between all the parties involved. Um, I think just having the one meeting that we all had at the um, community summit was good, but it wasn't quite enough and it was quick and it was sudden and it was what I need sorry it's skipped out is that the end okay but it wasn't there it goes. Enough. Okay. That, that's one of the more, more communicative. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Wow. Some powerful stories today. Um, thank you for those of you who have shared. I was just thinking, um, yeah, I wish some legislators were in here today. <laughs> And I think that, you know, what comes from that is that we've got to figure out what do we do next and what would fix things so that we don't have to hear these stories, so that these stories don't happen. Um, and I think that will, there'll be lots of conversations spurred from some of these things. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for all who are being here today to, to give information and share. Um, Okay, we're going to move forward and talk about what's happening with the legislature now. Let me um, share my screen again. Let's see. Show all my screens. Well, Kathy's queuing that up, just so everybody knows, this was a really important week. Uh, all the budgets are out. The bills are wrapping up their policy committee. So today's Wednesday. I think they have to be out of there 
their flipped house policy committee, if you will, today. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have more word on what survives and what doesn't in the next several hours. Um, Kathy's going to show you a graphic that right now just highlights the differences between the House and the Senate, maybe where the governor's budget was, and where we see gaps between those those different items. She's done an amazing job getting that put together in a matter of hours. <laughs> so thank you, Kathy. Yep. I just had to find it here. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of stuff happening. So, and cutoff for bills is today to come out of the house of origin. So if it was on the house side, it, you know, it's got to go one, one way or the other, it's got to be out today. So you'll see what I'm, really kind of impressed with this on this chart so many of our bills have that have been on our list have moved forward so that's that's kind of exciting i don't see too many that are worried about we're worried about dying um the other thing that's happening is the budgets are out so i will share with you after we talk about the bills we'll talk about the budget so um okay the housing bills are still there um, the Affordable Housing Act, um, we're hearing um, that it may make a move out of um, the House Committee this week. We'll see, hopefully. Um, we're encouraging people to contact the legislature, particularly folks in finance, and asking them that, to make that bill come forward and move it along. Um, but I think continuing to talk to your legislators about that bill would be important. If that is important to you. Um, a couple of things. There were hearings that I know a lot of people have been asking about the individual provider bill. Um, it is, there's a, we think that there was some questions around the training when they added additional family types and, um, it has, it has an executive hearing today. We understand there may be a couple of amendments that might fix some of our concerns, but pay attention to that. Um, let's see some of these, I'm gonna skip through some of these that we aren't following closely. I haven't heard this medically complex bill, if that's important to you, I have not heard it have an executive hearing yet. I probably need to check on that. It still may be in, long-term care. Um, let's see, I'm gonna move down. The burden of proof bill made it out, we believe. <laughs> so that is really good. It is in ha the House side came from this originally from the Senate. That's important to you. I would be talking to your House members about that bill and hopefully it's getting ready to have um, you know, move to rules. Um, the infants and toddlers bill has an executive session today as well. Um, that could use some help. There's some bills around prototypical staffing bills are moving. It was moving. Um, the cap, the special ed cap bill has a executive session built today. Um, did I hear something about um, the restraint and isolation bill has an ex executive session today at 10, like right now, probably. So follow along. Um, the safety net is moving along. The funding for IDEA, it, that's just a joint resolution. It's moving right along. Um, some of these other bills have executive sessions today, so some of them this morning. I'm going to let Sean share about the Nothing About Us Without Us bill when it come, when he talks. Um, and then some of these other bills also have executive sessions. So lots happening, but, um, you know, there's been a lot of hearings this week. So now we're just seeing if they get to move to the next level. And the next cutoff date is like next week, the 26th you know, where they've got to get out of the fiscal community committee by next, um, I believe it's Tuesday, Tuesday, I think, <laughs> Monday or Tuesday. So things are moving quick. All right. Are there any questions specifically about the bill? Bills. Okay. I'm going to see if I can move this and just switch screen. Hold on. 
Oops, not wrong. Wrong way. Are you seeing the budget now, Stacy? Yeah, we see it. Okay, good. Okay, this is a little bit different look for our budget bill. Um, so we in um. So yellow means we support, blue needs attention, and gray kind of means it's under review. And then there's some things that we just aren't commenting on at this point of time. So um, some things that are important to know, um, in the house budget, there was money for the supported living rate in increase. Not a huge amount, you know, as much as they need, but it's some there. It's not in the Senate side. So that's a real concern. Um, employment and inclu community inclusion also is in the house. Um, you should know that the CI increase is more than the employment increase. So it, it's a higher percentage for CI than for employment. That's also not in the Senate. The caseload reduction, that's you know lowering the caseload for case managers. That's across all three. Parent to parent and informing families. It's in all the budgets. We're happy about that. Um, let's see. There's the day hab. There's a study about day habilitation that is um, in the house budget um, to see whether they would and to make a proposal about that for the waiver. And let's see. There's this Lake Burien. Um, complex for for youth. It's a transitional one. We're trying to figure out how we feel about that. Um, there is, we talked about this, I think, last week. There's money in the Senate for both the House and the Senate for professional guardians for individuals who are coming out of RHCs, residential habilitation centers. That's to go into community settings. And the reason that's important is when they go to community set settings, it will, um, the rate goes down for them. So it's a disincentive for that guardian for the person to leave an RHC. So we think that if we can pay them the same rate that they're getting in the RHC, that that might be incentive for them to have their people they're guardian over move out into the community there's a difference in between the house and the senate um we're not sure what that means but you know we're happy even if we just get the the senate amount we'd be okay um that would be a a lot of progress um there the rare disease there the, there was some things around the rare disease um point of contact in the senate but not the house um, there was money to establish respite care beds in the Tri-City. I think this is for overnight planned respite. It's not in the house. Um, so that's kind of important. Um, there was a rate increase for assisted living. Um, another, this was in, it was in two places, the rare disease content. There's a money for study, um, again, in the Senate, not the house. Um, the ESIT bill, um, it, you know, the rate increase um, is in the House, but not the Senate. And I'm, it's probably because there's a bill there. Um, let's see. There wasn't anything for the waiver for foster children. Um, the ECAP rate increase was there. Um, there was money for... Um, a rate increase for kids. Um, I think this is more an education that probably is supposed to be OSPI to match the basic education amount. Um, uh, it's early ed, so it's in DCYF. Okay. Um, there was a program. Um, sorry, and I well, some of the lines got covered up, so I'll have to fix that. Um, the, there was an inclusion expansion to work with um, child care teams um, to really help with inclusive practices and ch children with disabilities um, and how to um, that have difficult behaviors. And so um, we were hoping that it was in it was in the Senate, but it's not in the House. So that might be something it would be Northwest Center that um, had requested that. 
Um, I'm not sure this this was something in a transition to kindergarten coordinating coordination. Um, some of this special ed, the safety net is in one, but not the, you know, in the Senate, but not the House. Um, prototypical school staffing is in the Senate. I don't think it's in the House. That's because the Senate has the bill. Um, and that would, the reason that's important is that includes paraeducators. And so that's why that that is there. Um, here's, there's money for the cap. And it's, isn't it interesting that they all have different amounts? This one on the left is the governor's budget, but this is the Senate and the House. But we'll, we're happy if they increase it somewhat. So hopefully one of those will land. Um, both the House and the Senate have money for recruiting special education teachers, which we think is probably a good thing. Um, there is for implementation in the House of the Restraint and Isolation Bill that was in the budget. Um, there's a special education performance audit. We don't know how we feel about that. There was some money for diversion programs for True Blood, um, some money for SSP, for people in medical facilities to to get a mount um the oops there's another place that got covered up the tiered rate for adult family homes um, that was the collectively bargained it was there um project echo um which is really important for training some of the things we talked about today is training um you know medical providers and uh, others to work with our folks um and that's what and around diagnosis and other things um this bill or this money would help with that this project echo and start it's in the house but not the senate um the preservation of records all that was for 6125 that all was fell into four different places in the senate budget so it's a little bit here a little bit there um but it's there so that's good news but we need to get that in the house um let's see point of contact that this is weird it ended up in long-term care and in dda so there's a little bit money here and money there um there was money for uh intersectional summit um which would bring out of state legis st le state legislators from across the u.s to come together to talk about dda issues um, there's also one for a conference for um, um, and also for intersectional folks. Um, for, yeah, it's the other way um, around, Kath. The intersectional I the conferences. Way around. Yeah. <laughs> right, one of them is which, sorry. Um, the intersectional one is for the BIPOC community to come together to learn. Um, and have a conference and then around DD issues. And the other one is for um, state state legislators from across the country to come together and talk about DD issues. That's in the House, not the Senate. Um, there's a, a little bit, for, I think, for some study about how to do IED housing in Snohomish and Skagit counties, um, which is a good thing. In the capital budget, some really good news. Um, both the House and Senate have $20 million um, for DD housing set aside. So that is really great news. Um, you know, just historically to kind of understand, we used to get one to $2 million every year. So, and last year we got 25. So that's $45 million dollars over this two year period, that's really historic. And we're really excited about that. So we're, we're hoping that there's no snafu that that should be there in both sides. Open Doors also got 5 million um, for um, their project, both in the House and Senate. Um, I know the Arc of King County is concerned because they are, their project was not funded anywhere. And the 20 million there, they would be because of the language in it, wouldn't be able to access that. So there's a lot there. Okay, I'd, let's see. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Let's see where we are. Um, great, let's see. 
are there, can somebody read to me, tell me if there's specific questions in the chat or elsewhere that I need to pay attention to? I don't think I, don't I see. see I don't see any. Yeah. No questions? Okay. Yeah. I'll take that. Just a lot of comments in the chat. Great. So very, inf very informational though. So. Super. And then let me share Sean's video. Um, let's see. Share screen and then I'll let Sean, Sean, it'll be, Sean will be on. Let's see. There we go. And just remember again, these are evolving. Oh, that's the video cast. Yeah, right. Let's see. I've got to share this big. You see it now? We see there it now. Go. Okay. There we go. Hi, I'm Sean Latham the Policy Coordinator for Self-Advocates and Leadership. And I'm Jessica Renner from Self-Advocates and Leadership. We want to thank everyone for taking your time out today to join us for Advocacy Days. We're here to talk to you about how to become a trusted resource for legislators on issues that affect your life. Even though your elected officials represent you, they can't do this very well if they don't know what you want. We want to encourage you to contact your legislators throughout session, but especially this week, about the issues that matter to you. That's right. With so many topics for legislators to learn about, your knowledge of developmental disabilities helps them to do their job. You are the expert in telling your story and how it relates to decisions they are making. Here are some tips to help you make the most impact. Your time with legislators, staff, or aides is short, and your message should be too. When you communicate, sum up what the issue is and why it's important to you. Have a specific request related to a bill or budget item. Attack the problem, not the person. Follow up with a thank you. By doing this, you greatly increase your credibility and strengthen your legislative relationships. Bottom line, stick to what you know which is your life and how the issue affects you. Here are some ways that you can reach out to your legislators. You can email them and their legislative assistants about your priorities. To email your legislator, visit www.leg.wa.gov. From there, click on Communicate with a Legislator or participate in a committee hearing. Then, under Communicating with a Legislator, click Send an Email. From there, you can find and choose your representative. Click on their name, fill in your contact information, and send your message. You can contact them through the legislative hotline phone number and ask to leave a message for them. We also encourage you to request either an in-person meeting with them or a meeting over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Please reach out to the legislative assistant of the legislator to request a meeting. You can watch the legislature at work on TVW, either on your TV, if you have the channel, or online at tvw.org. Another way you can participate is by signing up to testify at legislative hearings. For each hearing, you can sign up for the individual bills as pro, meaning you are for the bill, con, meaning you are against the bill, or other if you have concerns with the bill you generally like. Please remember before you speak at a hearing, note what bill you are testifying about, and be sure you know what the focus of the bill is. Let me now take you through the process using the Washington State Legislative website that can be found at leg.wi.gov. On the website under the section, Let Your Voice Be Heard, click on the button that has participate in the committee hearing on it. From there under the participating in a community hearing section, click on testifying in a committee hearing. Next choose if you testifying in a Senate hearing or House hearing. We all have the choice to testify in person, testify by video remotely, or we can submit written testimony or just state what our position is on the bill. 
After you pick one of the options, you will be taken to the form to register. You will need to fill out your position, your name, your email, your address, your phone number, and your organization if you are representing one. It also asks you if you will testify on a panel or not. If you are testifying on a panel it will ask you to fill in the names of the other panelists. The other box to make note of is the pronunciation box. If you want your name said right you can sound it out in that box. Please also check the box I'm not a robot at the end of the form and then it's time to hit submit registration. Once you submit your registration you will receive an email from a committee staff email address. Please read this email carefully and add the meeting to your desired calendar using the links in the email. From there make sure you are ready to testify. Don't forget about social media. A lot of legislators have accounts on Facebook and Twitter where you can comment or watch live stream chats and virtual town halls. It's so important to stay informed and involved. Participate in virtual advocacy days, sign up for the Arc of Washington's action alerts, get updates at arcwa.org, and follow on Facebook. Connect with local parent and self-advocate groups. For more information, check out the Arc of Washington's Hot Tips publication on our advocacy page at arcwa.org, available in English or Spanish. And remember, change is made by those who show up. Happy Advocacy Day everyone. We are nearing the end of session, and I, for one, am glad to get a little more rest. But I will miss it some too. Since we are nearing the end, it's time again to follow the rules committees. And also the House and Senate floors, which will show us what bills will be passed. I wanted to remind you that you can visit the legislative website and see what bills are coming up for a vote on the floor. You can just go to leg.wa.gov. Once you are on that page, look for the prompt, What's Happening on the Floor? Underneath, you can click on the links for the House Floor Calendar and the Senate Floor Calendar. <laughs> These links will take you to the place to see what bills are coming up for a floor vote. Please check it out. And please check out the TVW website to see the House and Senate in action at TVW.org. I have watched several hearings this week, and I got to go in person to a hearing last week, which was interesting to watch from that viewpoint. I wanted to quickly tell you that the Nothing About Us Without Us Act did pass out of the Senate State Government and Elections Committee this week, and now it moves to Senate rules. I want to personally thank everyone for their help on this and ask you again to help us get it out of rules and get to the floor for the final vote. Our coalition will have a meeting on Friday at 1 p.m. to discuss our final strategy to get the bill across the finish line. Please contact me if you want the Zoom link for that meeting. Okay, let's talk about the one pager. As we know, there are a lot of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their families dealing with a variety of crises. We know there's a great need to have a variety of providers be educated and fully trained so that they can assist people with high complex needs. This includes both complex physical needs and complex challenging expressive needs. When we as a state and a community truly care and fund sees we can prevent a crisis. We can prevent emergency room visit. We can prevent hospitalization. We can prevent institutionalization. We urge you to help us this session, get the needed investment in not only training, but also planning, because if we can plan, we can prevent. 
I encourage you to read through the whole list on the one pager about what we need, because it's a great list. Here is three things of what we are watching for this session and beyond. One, preventing inappropriate hospitalization. Two, building residential capacity to support people with complex needs. And three, increase provider rates to stabilize supported living. For more information about these and other issues, I'm going to post this week's one pager in the chat. Also again, please see the ARC spills of interests. For additional information. Lastly, I want to encourage you to fill out our Advocacy Day survey. This helps us understand what you like and what you didn't like about Advocacy Day, so we can get better and better. You have the option of filling out the Zoom survey that you should see on the screen now, or alternatively, you can click on the links I posted in the chat. There will be an English and Spanish link. Let us know after if you need any assistance in filling out the survey. With that, I will just say thank you everyone for attending and go advocate for your needs. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, your, I saw, I got a, I got to see Sean's testimony, um, the video recording to that, um, and uh, Sean did wonderfully representing Sale and every all the self advocates. Um, I saw Robert on there and Ivano um, virtually and Ivanova virtually. They all did a wonderful job, um, um, and I think uh, it really um, showed. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for joining us here today. And thanks for Sean for all the information being so helpful and providing information in plain language. It's been helpful even for me to access some of that and learning more um, as I go. But um, we know that today was a really heavy topic with um, some powerful stories. Um, so please take care of yourself today, especially as we're, as it's gonna be a kind of a grind um, since we only have a few like short weeks of session left. Um, but yeah, take care of yourself. And I want to thank all our speakers and DDA for being here today. Um, anything you would like to add, Tanika? No, I think you covered it pretty good. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for filling out the poll. Um, it, we do have it in Spanish in the chat if you need to fill it out that way or if you cannot access your Zoom. Uh, if you can't access your Zoom, you're on Zoom right now. If you cannot access the poll, um, feel, feel free to fill it out. It's in the chat. And just thank you again for being here. This was a heavy week. Those were some tough stories, but that's how we get the advocacy done. I put it in the chat. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, Sean said it, you know, change is made by those who show up. So thank you for showing up. Go out there and get those legislators and talk to them about getting those bills out. And thank you again for joining us. Yes. Um, yep, exactly. Make sure you reach out.